I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Bob, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank, I'm sorry I broke the moment. <laughs> um, wow. I just... That took me to a place. Did it take you to a place? Mm. And Jim's reading, too, was ex- right in, in line with all of that, with what I'm, what I'm going to talk with you about today. Just, I love divine synchronicity, but the message is pretty clear. Go inside to find my God. You like my new trappings? <laughs> okay. I'm really happy to be back with you. And uh, I want to take this moment to thank everyone who did something to keep things moving smoothly and the people who helped me when I was away and needing transportation and and assistance um, just thank you from the bottom of my heart when uh, you know the bumper sticker it takes a village but I'm telling you it it does and I'm so grateful for our community and for how you you all just were here and stepped up and a special thanks to our three practitioners Jim Grove, Kathleen Frankert, and Jaron Nelson, who did that one Sunday while I was away. Well, I came and got to be a passenger, but they did the heavy lifting, and they did a magnificent job. It so inspired me, and I know inspired all of you. So thank you. So that song, I Go Inside to Find My God, reminded me of a statement by Howard Thurman, who was a theologian, a a civil rights activist, very prominent, an author, an educator, and he lived until the 1980s. But here's what he said very simply. I tap the resource that is beyond me by tapping the resource that is within me. I tap that which is beyond and outside of me Not by going further out, but by going back within. I go inside to find my God. So we all hear that idea, that concept, and we think it's really quite lovely and really swell. But there's that background noise of, yeah, but I have problems. I have needs. I have stuff going on in in my everyday life. I got people. I got all of this that I have to deal with. And right behind that, our first tendency is to get busy and look where? Not inside, outside. We reach outside immediately. And so today I would like to remind us, because I know you know this, but to remind us uh, of, of that beautiful resource within, about looking within, and two question, or a question you might have then is, you know, why should I look inside? And I have a couple of, couple of uh, suggestions of why at least of why I believe this is so spot on with living life fully. First thing is, I don't know about you, but um, on a daily basis I find myself inundated with noise from outside, the noise of fear, conflict, chaos, anger, frustration, and that's just in the first 60 seconds when I turn on my phone and my iPad, right? And a whole lot of that tumult that's going around and it is, it, it, it just hits us. It's that stew pot of people's attempts to go outside and fix and fight and affix blame and proclaim their way is the only solution and um, to denigrate those of other people. It's, it's gotten to be a common, common theme uh, more and more, it seems to me. Um, probably in every generation, but it just seems like it's so intense right now. And that attempt that we, that, and all the chaos that comes from people reaching outside to try and fix all that's going on is what we call in science of mind dealing with the effects. Dealing with the effects. And also in science of mind, our realization is, as we start to, re- to know that that's not where the solution is, we say that poking around and stirring up all the outside stuff trying to fix it is about as effective as rearranging the furniture on the deck of the sinking ship, the Titanic. Now, I'm not saying don't take action. We're going to get to that. But against that backdrop, backdrop, 
like in that song, I find that I am more and more leaning into what I know to be the great, greater truth, which is at the core of of this beautiful science of mind teaching. And as a matter of fact, it's at the core of all the great spiritual teachings. We don't have a corner on this. And that truth is that there is but one infinite source of everything we need. In that song, it said, when I go inside, there's more than enough. The truth is that there is that one infinite source, and you can call it God or infinite intelligence, the universe, the infinite. I like to call it God because it's a shortcut. But when I turn within, when I remember that, in the midst of all the tumult, I find almost instantly I am lifted from the futility of the endless rearranging of effects, and I'm moved into the perfect solutions that originate in that one place, which we also, in our teaching of science of mind, call cause, first cause. Excuse the terminology, but as you learn more about this marvelous teaching, you realize that The true cause, source of everything is that one, spirit, God, the infinite, within. And all the rest of that stuff outside is effect. So when I do this, when I remember this, the clarity of it, the purity of it, feels to me like a refreshing, deep breath of oxygen to my soul, to my mind, to my thinking, and to my life, to my day to the thing that's in front of me. When I remember to go inside, when I remember that's where my source begins, it lifts me, it moves me in a way that the outer tumult is just kind of like background noise. And I find, as the song said again, there's a peace, and then from that comes guidance, and even ordinary miracles, as our practitioners spoke about in our last month of the theme of being miracles, and their Sunday was about ordinary miracles. I find that's what happens when I take my hands off the wheel, off the plow, go within. First of all, there's peace, and then there's guidance, and ordinary miracles follow. And I want that for you. My passion for all my decades of ministry has been really simple. It has been to teach and to share and hopefully learn to walk this life-transforming message. And I know that you are all on, on that path at various points along the way. And when I, when I see the joy in your face and the sparkle and, the, and, the, and the, um, sometimes in the difficult times, but I see that you're, you're trying it out, let me see if this works. I'm so happy because it truly is, it's truly oxygen for the soul. So the second reason now, that was the first reason, was simply that to go within and find my God is to go to the source, go to the place where, quit wasting my time on the outside stuff. The second is kind of a news flash. I go inside to find my God because, as the brilliant New Thought teacher, Emma Curtis Hopkins, said so long ago, because your good is your God and your God is your good. I go inside to find my God. I go inside to find my good. Oh, one-stop shopping, whatever I'm seeking. Don't keep looking around out there. Go within. And this is not blasphemy. Here's, you know, she, this could be a whole other message, but here's what she says about that. She said, the statement, I am seeking my good and my good is my God, is a simple truth because our desires for good are about expanding into more and more of our greatness, more and more of who we are, more and more of all our possibilities, which is what the infinite, the creator's intention is for us. So do you see I go inside to find my God, and oh, when I'm looking for my good, I go inside and find that. Behind every desire that you have is really a desire to be more of your infinite, your God self, your pure potential. 
So that's another reason to go inside to find my God, find your God. So I've been thinking about this a lot in the past couple of weeks because I, I just, it, I've had the time to reflect on it. Let me put it that way. I have time to really relish it, to just experience it. And out of all of that came my title for today and what you saw on the sign as you're coming in which is do less and be more. Do less and be more. Because you see, if you're going within, you're being, you're not doing a whole lot of things. So that's the title for today and for next week, too, as a matter of fact. Do less and be more. And the reason I had this time was a couple of weeks ago, I had a planned procedure done on my this foot. Uh, I had painful tendonitis for a long time and finally uh, proceeded with with this particular um, thing that the doctor did, and it it's, it's, uh, has a lot of promise, and it takes a lot of time for it to do its thing. It's a particular kind of injection, and I have to be patient. Ooh, <laughs> I have to, you know, do, do less and be more. And the doctor's orders, of course, were to stay off that foot for as much as possible, especially the first week, and then um, as long as needed, and then to wear this boot whenever I leave home. Oh, and by the way, it isn't, you don't just wear the boot. You have to put the orthotics inside, and oh, not just any orthotics. You have to get special ones from the doctor. And, um, and that's to hold me while they're making my customized orthotics. And then you have to get a thing called... Um, even up for the other foot. Isn't that a brilliant name? It, it just lifts my other foot so, you know, I'm walking evenly. <laughs> they could, you know, in all this world of technology, they could have come up maybe with a more sexy name, but even up, there you go. So anyway, this has been kind of the story of my, my past couple of weeks. So I had, to, I had to do less. I had to do less, and I had to be more. And again, I want to say thank you to the people who were there to give me rides and bring me food and just make sure I was doing okay, meant the world. So, well, typically my idea of a productive day would be to get busy and do stuff. Just the opposite was now the case, and I had to do less. I had to get out of the way of my body's brilliant ability to heal. You know our bodies are wired to heal. If we just get out of the way, that meant I had to not be stepping on that foot so much. And whenever I did forget and try to do more, my foot reminded me to stop and get back to just being while the healing was taking place. And you know what? This practice of be le- be, do less and be more it applies to any situation you're facing right now. Just know that. Just try that. Because generally when we're facing a challenge, again, it's like do more. Reverse that. Do less, be more. Here's what Dr. Ernest Holmes, the architect of our philosophy, said about this. He said, you must become more. You must be more. You must become more. And by becoming more, that is in thought, in consciousness, in your imagination, how you see yourself, how you see life. Be more. You have to do that if you wish to draw greater good into your life. Become more. Not, he didn't say you must do more. He never did. You must be more. And why is that? Well, that's a whole other conversation, too, a whole other science of mind lesson. But the simple reason for that is by being more, by expanding our consciousness of who we are, the the perception of who who we think we are, who God is, what our possibilities are, it's kind of like provides a mold, and that's Holmes' word. He says, and I remember jello molds. Yeah, It, it provides a mold for the infinite, to pour in its good, to bring that good forth. And if we are kind of stuck in a being less, then there's only some, the good is all there, but just a little bit can find its way through us. And so that's why he says, be more. You must become more if you want to experience more. Now, I want to say that this being more and doing less does not preclude action. Doing less does not mean doing nothing. 
it's more of a matter of sequence. It's a matter of priorities. Uh, in in uh, this wonderful daily reading book, 365 Days of Richer Living, there's a passage by another one of our early New Thought teachers, Raymond Charles Barker, and he said, there's nothing to do, only something to know. Just take that and chew on it this week. That's your, that's your first, you know, I'm not saying don't do anything, but first. There's nothing to do, only something to, to know. To know what? To know this. He goes on to say, the secret of self-mastery is a simple one. It's the clear concept that creation begins and ends within the consciousness of the individual. Any creation, creativity, anything in your life, in your outer life, begins in your thought, your belief, your subconscious, your imagination, your consciousness. And taking it to the next level then, moving it to, okay, when do I, when do I take this to the streets? When do I take this out to, to take action? Holmes said, while there is an eternal stillness in the innermost recesses of our soul, as we're talking about going inside to find my God, he said there is also a place at the circumference of our being, animated by that inner spirit, it goes forth to accomplish. So the center be of our being is that peace, and he says the, the eternal stillness. And then at the circumference, there is that, that energy that is animated by that inner stillness, and that goes forth to, to accomplish. Um, this reminded me of back in grade school, remember, um, stop, look, and listen? I, was that before we could cross the street? That was one of the stop was the biggie, and then look, and then listen. Well, I think that applies here. That's a great spiritual lesson, you know? Stop and go within. Turn away from those effects. Go within. And then from that place, from that inner place, as Holmes said, look out. Look out and listen. Pay attention for the guidance, the actions that are yours to do. So I want to talk a little bit about this you know, against the backdrop of the, all the hoopla about the coronavirus because it's all been in our faces and it's every time you turn on any media, there it is. And, you know, anytime I'm doing a message here, I like to bring it into whatever's going on in our daily lives. So this seemed an obvious lesson and here's, here are a couple of thoughts. It's only been a couple of months, and that thing has just escalated in, in, um, in our view and all the information that's coming to us and whatever, is, whatever it is and what it, how it is replicating. And while it is certainly a serious concern and it calls for us to be vigilant and to do our part with common sense, I believe it also provides us an opportunity to really lean into our spiritual practice what better opportunity than every time you turn on the TV, your computer, your device, and you see that stuff, you go right, wait a minute, I'm going within to find my God. I'm going to stop first, and I will be guided from that place. And from this place, I will find peace. And, of course, this is my mother hen part coming out now, but as my mom used to always say, and your mom too, wash your hands. Wash your hands. And you heard this one? Um, wash it for the amount of time it takes you to sing happy birthday twice. I, I love that. My nurse sister told me that. And, um, and that's much easier than trying to figure. They say 20 seconds. I can never, you know, I lose track. <laughs> but I can sing quietly. You sing in your head. You can sing happy birthday. But out loud if you want to. So that's a, there are good practical things to do, and I would not minimize those for a minute. But stop Look and listen and then act. And along with that, when tempted to f go right into fear and even panic, and right now there's so much, that you'll hear all of these incredibly impressive statistics that are, you know, sometimes not in the order of importance, but certainly in order of uh, getting your attention. And then at the very bottom it'll say, but, but don't panic. But don't be afraid. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, first of all, whenever I hear someone say, don't panic, don't be afraid, I say, come on, let's, let's take the word panic out of there. Let's turn it around and say, just be calm. Be calm and wash your hands, okay? How's that? It's much better, don't you think? But that reminded me of this fable. You've probably heard versions of it. It's been around forever, but it's, it's, it's so relevant. There was a traveler in the 14th century, and, and he, he was going along the road, and he met the Grim Reaper. Now, there was a plague spreading over the land, and it was threatening the entire population. So the traveler asked the Grim Reaper, Grim Reaper where are you going? And the response was, well, I'm going to make certain that this plague kills 25,000 people. Well, years later, they met again. And the traveler was oddly kind of miffed because he said, you know, there, there were all, you, 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 you did what you said you were going to do and, and more. There were, all these people died. And the response of the Grim Reaper was, oh, no. He said, I only killed 2,500 people. Fear killed the rest. Fear killed the rest. So it's very toxic. So let's, so, so let's just say that doesn't have to be part of our, uh, our, our experience. Be vigilant, be cautious, be careful. Stay calm and wash your hands. Stop and go inside and find your God, the one source. Another way of saying this is that beautiful chant that we often sing, and it's a biblical passage, you know it. Be still and know that I am. And you know the chant we just sang was, God is, I am. God is, I am, God is. Okay. Be still and know that I am God. And then you can bring it down and say, be still and know. And if you're really in a hurry, be still. And if you're in an even bigger hurry, just be. Just be. And breathe and find how calm and peaceful you are. One of our seasoned, long-time, now retired ministers in the organization of Centers for Spiritual Living, her name is Dr. Sue Rubin. Uh, she, I have to tell you, she is, she's utterly amazing. She is 90-plus. Um, Erwin and I knew her very well back in the day. We used to go to various conventions and go out to dinner with her, and she was just so much fun and just full of life and full of knowing her truth, always, always, always. And so what she loves to do now is she'll go into Starbucks, and she'll just sit and she'll see who looks like they might want to have a conversation. (laughs) It could be kids. It could be um, seniors. It could be a couple. And then she, with their permission, she will write them on Facebook. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And it's just amazing. She is so open to where they, meeting them where they are, and then, of course, sharing a whole lot of positive reinforcement good news. So she wrote a spiritual mind treatment or an affirmative prayer uh, on the list to all, all of us ministers uh, just a couple of days ago in the face of all of this coronavirus uh, stuff going on. And here's part of what she wrote. These are th- this is, takes you again right out of, the, out of the effects and right to cause. I consciously and calmly anchor myself in my I amness. I am spiritually motivated to take the actions that I take personally, collectively, locally, and globally. I inwardly ask the one for humanly applicable universal tools and techniques that will project the essence of the indwelling compassion and balance and peace and wisdom that I am. Therefore, my daily involvement in the world reflects God, by whatever name, reflects God through and by means of me. And she continues to say, my God self reveals where to go, what to do, and where best to energetically invest my time, my talent, and my treasure. This is my daily offering to the world. And so it is. Don't you love that? It's priorities. It's getting things in the right sequence. So this does apply to any life challenges. Ernest Holmes said, Again, in the, in the mode of, of just being. He said, 
If we will take time daily to be at home with this truth, to sense the presence, before long something new and wonderful will be born because the creative power of God is at hand and all things are possible. For me, when I'm doing that, here's one of the... And you probably have your own way of, um, of, of visualizing, maybe, or the environment you create so that that helps you to do that, and so it's not just words. For me, I love to envision myself being held in this enormous container of infinite love, infinite everything, infinite intelligence, infinite possibility, huge. And so I'm just kind of... I'm. I'm just shielded. I'm, I'm and provided for. I'm in this kind of like big bubble. Well, there is another fable, and I'm going to close with this, which is um, similar to that, about becoming a lake. There was a Hindu master who had an apprentice that was constantly complaining about the pain in his life. And the, and the master got tired of that. So one morning, he sent this apprentice to get some salt And so when the apprentice returned, the master instructed the unhappy young man to put that handful of salt in a glass of water. And then he said, drink it. (laughs) Can you imagine? I mean, a handful of salt. Well, the master said, oh, how does it taste? And of course, the man was "Ah, bitter. He spit it out. So the master just chuckled and gave him another handful of salt. And then he took him to a nearby lake where he asked the young man to put that handful of salt into the lake and swirl it around until it was all dissolved. And then the master said, now take a drink from that lake. And the apprentice did. And as the water's dripping down his chin, the master asked, how does that taste? Well, fresh, remarked the the apprentice. And the master said, do you taste the salt? No, said the young man. At this, the master said, the pain of life is like that salt. But the amount of bitterness that we taste depends on the container we put the pain in. So when you're in pain, enlarge your sense of things. Stop being just like that glass, he said. Be a lake. So when you're going inside to find that place, if you find it... But the other stuff is so close. It's nagging at me. The thoughts are grabbing at me. Expand that moment. Expand that space where you are. And simply do less and be more. Bob is now going to anchor this with a terrific song, again, a favorite of ours, which my doctor could have probably said amen to as well because it's get out of the way. (laughs) So it is. (laughs) 